Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again, folks, to the Oregon Voters Digest. By George, we've got a show now. In fact, we're going to have a show. Uh, we're going to have a show for quite some time here between the co-hosts here. Well, you met John. He's he's here solid as a rock. He he does all of the research and this that and the other. Young man, I want to make sure you got to understand. I recognize young people too. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, but the bottom line is that as you know, we're focusing, i.e., in the swamp area. You've heard that word before, the swamp area, i.e. Portland, Oregon. We've had all sorts of action. And when you think about the largest city in the state of Oregon, it's called Portland, Oregon. And we've got transformation and reforms and all kinds of deals for with our present government that we that basically governs here in the state of Oregon, i.e. Portland, Oregon. And so consequently, this is huge. So we have been focusing in that area, and the number of candidates have been running. Some have, some have predicted that there's a possibility that 100 people might be a part of that, that whole process. And boy, I tell you when, you, when you hear the interview and the response we get from our good researcher, John, here, boy, I tell you, you're going to get excited. And, and right in front with it, there's more people to come. We just hear you about the last date and some of the possibilities, the rumors and things of that nature. It's going to be a very exciting show, and naturally I'm going to be a part of that, and I'm just going to be basically acting like one of the community persons here uh, sitting at the show, and we're going to let John carry the rest of it. And, uh, and I think it's going to be good because it's very, very important that we educate you about this particular period in time. Very important that you pay close attention because we got to get the right leadership the right leadership for this reform government. It's new to them, but guess what? In all due respect, with uh, former President Trump running on the national standpoint, he's got everybody excited about all kinds of things. And we want you to shift that you know, hitting CNN and Fox to Oregon Voters Digest here in the Portland metropolitan area because we've got our major concerns right here. And it's very, very important that we pick our leadership. So with that, I'm going to get John on the t at the table. And, uh, and format-wise, what we're going to do, we're going to talk a bit. And then from that point on, uh, I'm going to get up, and John is going to interview about several people uh, as far as some of the candidates that are going to be running in this new reform piece aspect of it. And then after that, uh, the following shows, we're going to continue doing the candidates, and we're going to give you a little history about this and this and that, give you a little update about this, this, that, and the other. So with that, John, how you doing? I'm doing well. Good afternoon, Bruce. Um, I think this was a great idea. This is an opportunity for me to uh, learn uh, from a group of candidates. They're all taking their own perspective yes. um, towards uh these district races. Right, uh, we've got about five candidates here today that I'm excited to uh, learn uh, learn more about yeah, yeah. and uh, learn about how they are going to go about addressing the problems that and we have. Through in you the, the and city. through you, the public's going to learn also too. Yes, thank you. But you know, before we jump into that, I wanted to ask you about that doozy of an ice storm that we had last week. Oh my God! Well, I know one thing. And excuse me, I, I live on the water. You got me. Okay. And I almost pulled out my skates. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> at one at one point in time, the the Willamette actually Willamette was just besides the Atlantic, uh, Willamette. But the bottom line is, at one point in time, it iced over the cross, the entire the, the entire lake. Oh wow! Okay. Okay. And folks were getting out there. I mean, ice skating. Uh, ice skating. Wow. I mean, with those guys, you know. Now, at that point in time, I, I excuse the French. Um, I'm not. I'm not an alcoholic in any way, shape, or form. Some of them were pulling that Jack Daniel out. See, <laughs> so I was out there looking at them, yeah. doing my little sipping. But other than that, I, I, I don't know if I could do that. Oh, you can do that. <laughs> I, I'll show you how. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see you on ice skates. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's cool. But there, there, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, there, some people were a little disappointed with uh, the city's res well the the, response. the the regional response yeah. uh, to the ice storm. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the criticisms that uh, that that I heard about were uh, people were disappointed that the shelters, uh, the warming shelters, mm -hmm. closed mm -hmm. while there was still ice mm -hmm. on the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, besides that, and, and another little thing, people concerned about the fact that you know, what kind of a checks I'm going to be writing to those plumbers. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I got I, mean, I got a link too. That, that and also to PGE. Uh, you know I mean, because that first month came in, uh, they just raised the rates, right? Mm -hmm. And even the seniors were hurting. All of a sudden, oh, yeah. they've been trying to figure out how am I going to pay up these mortgages, right? You got me. So there's some pretty. I, I would have thought that I'm sure that you know. Let's say for instance, let's say we were both sitting at the city 
Council. Let's just say we're not there. But the bottom line is that we were sitting up there, we would have probably gone to, to PGE, interviewed them, if you will, to a certain degree, and said, look, why don't, why don't you just sort of skip the first January, that first check? Especially for seniors, maybe for veterans. Got my point? Yeah, we, the people on fixed income are most yeah, vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, we, in we're trying to keep them in their housing, right? You got me? Social Security didn't go oh, up eighteen oh, percent. Oh, gee, well, it, it's it's crazy. So you're right. There was a lot of things about that ice cream that, that really hit hard. Yeah. What else is on your mind? Uh, you know the other. You know the power outages, like you said, and then also there was a lot of road cl closures from yes. trees yeah. uh, oh. falling down. Oh. Did you hear about that her uh, terrible story out in Lake Oswego where the guy was sleeping in the tree fell? Yes. yes, yes. It made me look a little bit different at the trees in my backyard. Yes. What about the tree? <laughs> what about this one guy? Are they trying uh, to murder me? And, and you are going, and it says, uh, it says uh, that he had gone to the city. Yeah. They asked him to cut down this this, this tree. Got me. And because they figured it was going to be dangerous or whatever. So all of a sudden, the ice storm comes in with the wind. Sure lit up, the tree fell on his house. Now, now you know what they're requiring or permit for him to take down the, yeah. the trees that yeah. already oh, fell down. Jesus to cut Christ. those stones. Gee, gee. Um, it doesn't seem very practical. No, 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 no. Now, well, that's, that's no due respect. That's why we want responsible people to be sitting in this city council seat. Because they represent us, not, not, not we represent them. I, I, yeah, I think one of the opportunities is with this new council, and, and this is one of the reasons I'm excited to interview these candidates, is we have a group of people with lived, real experience. Yeah. Um, a lot of people feel like we're being managed by the uh, professional uh, manager okay, class, okay, okay. rather than actual people that have practical experience okay, okay. Um, dealing in a retail sense with people that are impacted by That's these right. laws. But as long as they go through the certification process here on the Oregon Voters Digest with you and I. <laughs> Okay, right. yeah, I, like it. I mean, just I want to make sure that that resume fits what we're talking about. Right. Okay. Good. Sounds right. good. And so, um, you know, kind of moving on, uh, you, you wanted to give a little bit of updates on the filing deadline, or yeah, well, yeah. What, what about it? Where, where are well, we? Well, um, so uh, the filing deadline again is still June fifth. So June fifth. You know, now, what, what what is that date? So that's the the official date when one can uh, officially put their name uh, as running for city Rent council. Road. Right now, people um, can start doing sort of the pre-game, pre um, mm -hmm. setting up their campaign committee. Um, they can become part of the small donors program. Uh, the small donors program, um, you can start the qualification process, uh, but they don't start writing checks until about the middle of February okay, or so. so. So they can open up an account? Yes, open up a bank account. And it has to be certified, right? It's, uh, Through yeah, the state? Yeah, you have to open up a committee with the state. Okay. And then, then your permit, you know, that okay. gives it its, like, okay, okay. legal entity okay. status. So you can, you can, can you start spending money from that particular account at the same time? Yes, you can. Oh, you can? Yes, you can. Interesting. Okay. okay. You just won't have the match funds available. Oh, you. match funds. Right. But the person who's, who doesn't have it, who doesn't go in that particular program, can just file just like like they've done in the past, right? Pay yeah. Fee, right? Yeah. And I, I think, like, I, I still think we're going to have a big... Um, a big participation in the small donors program. Yeah, but um, the money's changed. It has, <laughs> um, but we do have a uh, campaign limit, you know, uh, right. donation limits in the city of Portland. So if somebody doesn't uh, be a part of the small donors program, they're still capped at the max donation of five hundred and seventy nine dollars. Um, and that's both. Uh, that's for the mayor's office and the commissioners. Yes. Okay. And if you are uh, five seventy nine, five seventy nine, and then if you're in the small donor program, and I, I don't know, I, I've kind of heard that this maximum might change. Okay. But um, three hundred and fifty dollars is the maximum donation if somebody's participating in the small donors program. Now is that is that is that the commissioners or the mayor? Both. Both of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. That's, that's really come down. And what about all those folks that are we're, we're looking at, at on the front end, saying, "Gee, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I've got to have two or three hundred thousand dollars sitting in my head. What's that? What's that all about? Well, I think uh, you know some people got a little bit ahead of themselves, and uh, they're going to be rethinking their strategy. Um, I know that one candidate I've heard out there uh, promotes that they've been giving their campaign manager a living wage. Really? Which I would equate wow. to about five thousand bucks, Jeez. right? And so, uh, if they started running in say September or October, um, 
they they've already spent about twenty thousand dollars just on a campaign manager. Well, they better be watching because I I know in the in the past from a historical standpoint, I've seen I've seen uh, candidates getting sued by the campaign manager because they had made a commitment and all of a sudden they jumped out. So, so you will pay in court. Trust me. So yeah, so candidates. so candidates will have to have a really uncomfortable conversation with their campaign manager. Yeah, yeah, just it's pull like, your checkbook out. It's like yeah, you know, it's like our 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 matching funds got cut 65 percent you know and and so who did this you're looking at uh it was actually um was it wheeler uh i i feel like it was there's a kind of a board that's responsible for election rules that voted on this but who voted on it the city Um, council had to sign off on it was it the mayor or was it the city council? I think the all? mayor just signs off of it from okay. an admin okay. sense. Okay. Just okay. because it's a bureau that he's responsible the for. The president but I council? don't think the whole city council it didn't. Uh, voted on it. Okay, I three, don't. Of them are, three of them are running for, for, for mayor. And uh, <laughs> at least two of them are part of the small donors program. Oh, oh, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Forgot all about that piece. Yes. Sounds good. It's going to be interesting. So maybe, maybe next time around, you're going to have to come up with another report. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe there might be some lawsuits or something coming in that deal. And so, um, okay, I did want to uh, move into the rumors portion of the show. What, that's oh, rumors. Like, uh, that's uh, well, we've got a couple of juicy rumors. ones. Oh wow, mm, uh, mm. it's no longer a rumor. I think we 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 were sharing the rumor that Dan Ryan was looking at uh, getting involved. Oh yes, I thought he was going Again. to do county. I thought he was thinking about Somebody the told me he was thinking about running for mayor. He was thinking about running for mayor. And some people thought, like, he's got a lot of support out there. I was talking to some people on the west side that really wanted to see him run uh, run for mayor. But Dan Ryan has decided to throw his hat into the District 2 race. District 2? For city council. Oh, he's going to maybe, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. because Maybe he might come back and, and deal with the homeless situation and the housing, which he never, which he never performed on. Yeah. Right? You got my point? Well... <laughs> 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 I hate to put it that way because he, he was perfect for that particular position yeah. because he and his brother both were at one point in time homeless mm-hmm. and, and having some major problem mental illness and this, that, and the other. So consequently, he had that connection between county and the city, but then he's just been, been sort of like musical chairs. He's been going from one one area to another, et cetera, and it's causing havoc. You know, well, arts I think commission and all kinds of stuff. Off the jump, what he, I do what I do appreciate about him is that he actually grew up in St. John's, uh, the Arbor Lodge neighborhood. Oh, he did? And then that's the neighborhood. Homeless? That, was uh, he homeless? He, well, I don't think he was homeless when he was growing up. He didn't? He grew I, up? I think that he had experienced a period of homeless. Oh, he homelessness. did experience it? Well, yeah. that's what we need. I, that's what I'm still talking about. Like, you haven't yeah, solved the problem. Practical experience. So, okay, so hey, Dan, hey, get back in the in in your your lane, if you will, and deal with the homeless and mental illness aspect of it. That's oh, the key. I, I would love to have Dan come on the show and Please, and, and, and uh, Dan, you, come share on his over. legislative priorities and mm-hmm. um, and I, I think that you, you know he's going to possess institutional knowledge, and so having somebody that has had some experience really governing. No, well, in the on the street. Now that's the that's the way I'm saying. Right. He's been on the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a good experience. Don't but he's also know. been at city council. What city council? Portland city council. Oh, I'm never. Oh, oh. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I only focus on. You know, we got to do something about these homeless situation and the housing and whatever. Absolutely. And and I've not seen anybody yet actually perform in in the right capacity. But anyway, we can talk about it. But yeah. Dan, please, you're invited. And I so I I don't know if you remember, but he ran against uh, Loretta Smith. Oh, I remember that. I remember and so that. that was in the 2020 special election. Uh, what made that one unique? I think that uh, election was in August of 2020, and so that was peak COVID. And mm-hmm. so the candidates had to find different ways to go about uh, getting their message out. Uh, mm-hmm. Knocking on doors was not that. Well, he had, he had corporate community. He had, he had the money. Mm-hmm. And he had all of the media. Uh, it was Oregonian, the Portland Tribune, Willamette Week, KOIN, Steve Dunn. I mean, he had the total pocketed deal, and he had it all. And in all due respect, it, I didn't see his resume. I've invited him over to come over and talk about it, but he didn't, he didn't want to. He didn't want to come over at that point in time. But I, I wasn't going to do anything but say, pull out your resume. That's all I was going to do. I, I guess I've gotten, you know, like I've, I've shared a lot of 
you know, kind of rubber chicken uh, yeah. dinners with Dan. You know, oh, really? Like, oh, yeah, just, you know, just over... Rubber uh, chicken. What, oh, what, you know, you what, know, on the yeah. non-profit circuit, when oh, you're oh, over oh, at the oh, oh. the Hilton Hotel, they yeah, always right, show, right. Yeah, always right, serve right, uh, right, chicken, right. but... Chico. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're right. There. I, I don't I don't know. That. He's always been a big supporter, uh, you know, of my mom. Yeah. Uh, he's always been involved in the non-profits and things like that, so... Um, I have gotten to get to know him on a casual uh, sense over the years, and um, well, he communicates well. Yeah, so for me, yeah, but he's I'm, been I'm a very not looking for just communicators. I I'm feel you want dealing outcomes. with issues. I want outcome <laughs> on issues. Okay, we got some dire issues. I feel you. Public safety. You know what I'm saying? How does he feel about the uh, maybe maybe law enforcement or whatever? And, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, hey, but get a lane. But you know, I think uh, he's. Uh, you know, being in office has probably changed his perspective on some things. You know, a lot of people, I think uh, he's had protests in front of his house seven times. It's going to be worse now. And so, you know, I've always been, you know, I'm a, I, I've am i always been very much against that. You know, it's like, come to my work and protest all yeah, you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you start bringing it home to like my mom and my, my, my children and things like that, yeah. um, that, that changes the emotional... Uh, calculus. But let me share this with you, and I'll share it, we're sharing it with Dan also, too. He had a resume. Mm -hmm. He had a lane. He had actual experience yeah. about homelessness, mm -hmm. housing, the whole nine yard, okay? So if he had stayed in that lane, hey, no one would be, de they don't demonstrate in front of me. I, I will, I, I, again, I don't know. I, I feel like there's... Um, uh, an extremist class on both sides of the political spectrum yeah, yeah. that don't want to hear dialogue yeah, and right, right. Uh, hear anybody else's perspective on on the solution uh, to our problems. And I think that has what le has led to yeah, that kind of our, our state of Portland right well, we'll now. We'll help it's him like out. We'll help him ideologies out. Ideologies over we'll outcomes. We'll help him out. Please invite him. Will you please? I will. And make sure you. I'm, I'm sending him a text right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah text, text him. Yeah, do that. <laughs> and make sure you let, let him know that he does have a resume. Okay. Absolutely. Got okay. Sounds good. What else you got? What rumors? You got anything else? Um. So like a, another interesting thing that um, oh, this Sam Adams guy. I heard something about a rumor. Yes. You know, you know keep well. Let's let's just keep it in district two then. Uh. You know, Sam Adams. Uh. There's a lot of rumors that he's going to be running for city council. Yes. Um. District he's, two, right? Uh. Yeah. District two. Awesome. Also. Awesome. Uh. He's got a strong resume, strong base. I think oh, he man. has a lot of positives and a lot of negatives. Vera Katz, man. Um, kind of, he's well trained. <laughs> He's done a lot of good work. And then the other uh, entrance into uh, District 2, who I'm excited to, we also have a District 2 uh, candidate coming on uh, in our second show today, Debbie Kitchen. Uh, but I'm, I'm also really excited for Tiffany Pinson. Um, okay. She got into the race. Uh, she is Portland native. Um, I think she graduated from Lincoln High School. Mm -hmm. um, her mom's Earlene Pinson, one of the uh, first really successful mm -hmm. black real estate mm -hmm. agents in Northeast Portland. Um, she brings like a 20 year uh, career at uh, the city of Portland. Um, she's done everything from procurement to uh, working at the mayor's office and everything like well, that. Well, it's a North Portland race. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the largest community and still picking up tab, if you will. Mm -hmm. And you've got some very interesting folks over there. You got a lot of I issues. All of, a lot of the issues are actually relevant in that particular area. So District Two really is North Portland. Yeah, North, North, Northeast. I know, you know Northeast. like Hollywood, Alameda, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and yeah. Uh, Irvington are yeah, going to play a really nice big area. role. In the, those are nice areas compared to North Portland. But they vote. Oh, they, they they do vote. Yeah, High vote. voter turnout. Yeah, they vote. And then you know, and and I think we have some pretty big issues in that district. Um, I believe they have the airport. I'm not sure if the airport's yeah, in two yeah. or one, but uh, they have the airport. You know, that's a big economic engine for the whole region. Um, we've got Interstate 5 and uh, the issue of whether we should add lanes to it and then also uh, caps mm -hmm. on Interstate 5. That's the issue that Albina Vision Trust is very passionate mm -hmm. about is helping reclaim that mm -hmm. land. Um, and you got the black community in there too. Right, right, right. You know, you've got SEI, huge service provider. Yeah, yeah. And um, and speaking of, on Albina Vision Trust, it sounds like they had a really good conversation with Portland Public Schools oh, I heard about, that, about yeah. uh, buying their building from Very interesting. Or doing some kind of um, building swap or something. I hate, I hate like to that. say it right now, it won't happen. Okay. Yeah. 
I'm just being, you know, I'm just being upfront and honest about that. I mean, I mean, uh, there was a group that tried to put the baseball. I was uh, part of that. We ra- we raised two hundred million down at yeah, the state I mean, legislature I, back I, in '01, and that was definitely I, I one of the. I thought it was an excellent idea. I mean, right on the water, so to speak, almost like San Francisco. We've got That's the exactly what San Francisco good rail did. access to yeah, it. it was, I think it, we have a lot of opportunity. I don't to know ha- what happened. Did they share enough of it with the communities and things of that nature? Um, did you guys do that? What do you mean? Well, I'm just saying, making sure that they were inclusive, you know. Well, I think that's what you Albina set aside a few jobs. If I you think will. that's what Albina community, uh, Alb- Albina Vision Trust. But what about right? when you were sitting on that deal with the with uh, the baseball? The, yes. Uh, no, we didn't get into the job creation what? aspect of it. Well, all yeah, we did, all we were doing was trying to raise money yeah, and find a site yeah. and and develop the political will. Mm-hmm. And with that instance, uh, we raised about 250 million at the state legislature. It's still sitting there, um, and. We brought the question up to Vera Katz to ask her if, uh, you know, she would get behind subsidizing mm-hmm, a baseball did. stadium. Well, what she did is she presented the question to the public, and then uh, the Native American gaming interest came in and said, we'll build a stadium for free if you what, put what it. Is this? What is this? The Native American Gaming Association. Where did they get their money? From gambling. Oh, that's a whole <laughs> different ball game. So yeah, so that's that's what the question became. Should okay. we allow a casino in in the city of Portland, and they'll build us a baseball stadium for it? And so that whole discourse went through. Man, that's, a, that's an excellent idea. As a taxpayer, I'd like that idea. Uh, so, but there was a little bit of pushback on that and everything like that. And then Mayor Katz went into her lame duck period. Well, I wish I had and, known that. Um, and then we had Tom Potter. Uh, who needed a committee for every decision that he wanted to make. Okay, okay, all right. Well, I but I think it. we're getting close to uh, having our first candidate. Yeah, same uh, good. But well, this has been uh, good. I know, you got, uh, I know you got more room. We got, we got, we, we we'll, got we'll, more. We'll pick, we just, we'll we'll pick just, him up. Maybe yep. pick him up at the end of the deal or pick him up on another show. No problem. But this has been good. Yes. This has been great. Hey, you get it, folks? Make sure you share it with your friends, if you will, when you when you get to show this. Probably going to be doing this Sunday or something, right? Mm-hmm. Going to be doing this Sunday. Sounds good. All right, Bruce, well, I'll right see there. you back here for that second segment. The other candidate's coming on right now, right? You can just stay right there. What's we'll it? Change seats. What was it? Eli. Oh, I remember that. Guy. Eli Arnold. Public seat. How you doing, Eli? Great. How you going, buddy? All right. Hang in there. Thank you very much. Hey, Michelle. you're welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, I had a really good time with you at the uh, MLK breakfast. Yeah. I, re- um, I, th- I thought it was. I thought it went really, really well. Uh, the coolest thing was like when you suggested that we take the uh, the picture, and then we got in front of the screen, <laughs> and then like we looked pretty cool doing it, and then all the other politicians wanted to come yeah. around and get like the picture taken uh, afterwards. I thought that was pretty maybe, validating. Maybe we were trendsetters there. Yeah, we were trendsetters. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, folks, I wanted to introduce you to Eli Arnold. He's a candidate in District Four. Um, let's. Tell us, tell us a little bit about you. About you. Uh, yeah, so District 4, I'm a Selwood resident, and um, uh, I first came to the Portland area in 2001, and um, you know, my background is sort of, you know, I got here, got married uh, to a young woman from Lentz, we had a baby, and I was like, I'm too poor to live in the city right now, uh, I gotta make some money, get some education and stuff, so I ended up uh, leaving for a while, spent some time in the army, and getting dragged all over the world. Uh, got a lot of got a lot of job training out of it. Became a pilot, became an officer, did a bunch of stuff. But really realized how much that constant like dislocation from community and family, uh, you know, really isn't a good thing for you. Yeah. And so I said, you know, I'm going to leave the army. I'm going to go back to Portland, and I'm never moving again. Nice. And uh, so we ended up uh, finding a house in Selwood, which you know we love. And uh, I'm like, okay, you know, community investment here. What can I do? And I ended up becoming a, a police officer. Excellent. And so it was uh, getting married is what drew you to Portland or made you stick here? No, it was, um, that's just kind of what happened after I got here. I just, you know, I was just kind of young and exploring. And uh, my dad had lived up here for a while. Okay. And I just kind of came and tried it out. And and then, uh, you know, Very chosen nice. chosen this permanent spot. All right. Um <clears throat> One of the things I, I I'm curious about, um, we're just kind of deviating a little bit, but uh, what's your favorite restaurant over in Selwood? I don't I don't oh, make man. it over there uh, that side of the river that much, but uh, I really like Zenbu. Okay. Um, but you know, actually, Selwood has a lot of good restaurants. Mm. Uh, it really does. So um, PDX Sliders, uh, Jade. I mean. I eat a lot. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I love being able to walk to them. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, it's good. And so I think like Selwood has the highest walkability score uh, in the city. I think like they got like a ninety-eight out of a yeah. hundred. It makes sense to me. I you know I walk to the grocery store. You know I feel like I'm living in Europe. Yeah. I go to the restaurant that way. Uh, spring water goes right by my house. I ride my bike to work when the weather's decent. Uh, yeah, it's a great location. Sounds like you do a lot of bike riding. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you ever track your mileage? Uh, I have, but uh, yeah, I'm not not one of those like distance guys. So. Well, I mean, but you do it for work, though, I right? Do. Yeah, right. Uh, so. I ride a a police bicycle uh, at work, so you know. But you you do a lot of stopping. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. you kind of <laughs> you do a lot of stopping. So I think at work. A strong day is like a 20 mile day that's, you know that's, something that's, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah that's movement uh yeah, is there it, is there something that drew you to uh the bicycle cop versus um you know like a, being a detective or in a cruiser or something like that? um you know i after i started the job i always wanted to work downtown so i it's not everybody's favorite but like i asked to and i got right down there and so i've spent the entire time in that area and, um, you know, what's, what's great about it is the people who are on uh, the bike squad, and of course I'm just here speaking uh, for myself, uh, but people who are on the bike squad have a lot of freedom to identify problems in that, that sort of core area mm -hmm. and just try to address it. You can be very proactive, um, you know, so if, say fentanyl starts showing up everywhere, uh, you, can, you can say, what are we going to do? How are we going to approach this? And I mean, that freedom, that agency and autonomy, and it's great. There are many jobs that give you that. Yeah. So do you feel that you connect with uh, the community better by being on a bicycle versus being in a cruiser? I, yeah. mean, I mean, to me, like one of the things that I've noticed that's changed about policing is like, you know, over like the last 50 years is like, you know, cops walked a beat and, you know, got to know people. and. Yeah. Um, you know, like my experience with uh, small t small town sheriffs, yeah. where they they know people. Um, you know, they know who lives there. They know who's crazy but not dangerous, and they know who's not strangers. Yeah. And so, to me, I've uh, you know the interactions I've I've had with like small town sheriffs um, have been very very good for that reason. So I was just kind of wondering if being on the bike gives you like a greater level of connection than being. I think so. Right. You're. You're out in the same air. You can immediately speak to each other. Um, so I think I think it does give you like a more immediate connection. Okay. And it, you know, and unfortunately, it's not something that a lot of people can get at the current time because there is just sh such a capacity shortage uh, that sort of sticks you to the car immediately. Get there mm -hmm. as fast as you can because something else is coming up in a minute. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, it it is kind of nice to be able to just immediately engage like that. Okay. And so uh, what made you decide to get into the race? So, like I said, right, I'm, I'm sort of committed to the city. Uh, I got four kids. I want oh, wow. my kids to live here. Okay. I'd like my grandkids to live here. I'm not moving ever. Uh, so I'm committed to the city, and we have some issues, right? And, you know, a police officer is, like, very much more uh, connected to political life, I think, than people realize. You sort of are the end user of policy. Mm-hmm. And so you see when there's a problem, uh, you're there staring somebody in the face when policy and resource allocation, everything else isn't like serving them. When, when somebody's harmed, uh, when somebody's not helped, when somebody's frustrated, like you're the one that has to look them in the eye. And so, you know, for the last six, seven years, it's like, okay, it's sort of the rise of, of homelessness and homeless camps and, and sort of associated issues. And, you know, okay, when are we, we going to do something about this? When, when are we going to do something about this? And then um, the spike in crime, fentanyl, um, you know, all these other issues. Um, you know, I've dealt with business owners who have, like, invested their whole life into something, and it's, like, gone. And, you know, you got to be there at that point. And I just feel like I haven't heard – I haven't heard people speak about it in a way that makes sense from what I'm seeing on the ground. And um, I spent my whole life in sort of, like, emergency response, both – in, in the military um, and then as a police officer and you know you have to do something in an emergency and that lack of like action that that vacuum of uh, leadership and, and decisiveness has been frustrating and so I thought you know what uh, if, if I got to do it myself I'll do it myself yeah I, I, I do really think the retail experience is and when I say retail is like 
having contact with regular people um, is a huge asset, you know, that a lot that I hope this new city council is able to capture. Yeah. Um, I really do feel that uh, a lot of our leaders that we have now are, you know, just kind of the professional managerial class that are largely pr- uh, protected by the impact of, of their decisions. Yeah. But you live it, you interact with it every day. Yeah, and, and we've kind of seen that like preference for for ideology, mm-hmm. which is maybe all you have when you don't have firsthand experience, right? <laughs> but like <laughs> ideology won't do the work. Uh, at some point, we have to actually go get our hands dirty. I like it. Yeah, that's well uh, well put. Um, I had another question for you. Is um, you kind of touched on it, but let's. Uh, why should people vote for it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the biggest point, right? Is um, I I know where the policy sort of uh, meets the road, and I've seen those breakdowns, and I just think it's a um, it's a very useful perspective to have, and that's been lacking. And maybe the big benefit of having a new large city council is we can get some people from like a wide variety of backgrounds, and somebody ought to know. I think, like. Um, yeah, how, like, we don't have ambulances sometimes now. Why is that? What's happening out there? Right. We tried to pass this camping ban. Why did? Why is that not going to work, even if the courts uh, let it go? And so I think it's a useful perspective, and um, I think there's a lot of people who are just ready for some action, mm-hmm. and I think that willingness to act decisively is uh, what I, I'm bringing to the table. Very nice. Very nice. And so then... Um, you know, in a dream scenario with your dream city council and your dream mayor and your dream mayor, uh, dream uh, city administrator, what would be like one or two uh, laws or policies that you'd like to implement, say? Yeah. Uh, the most important thing, I think the very first thing we have to do is we have to put some structure around homelessness. Um, so... Martin v. Boise, Ninth Circuit ruling made it tough. Like, it basically said, you can't say there's nowhere for people to go. And in response to that, we just decided to do nothing, ask nothing. And, you know, we saw this with the ADA lawsuit um, for blocking sidewalks for people who are disabled. Like, doing nothing is never a solution. And so we've waited all these years. Let's come into compliance with it. Let's designate spaces where people can go. And then we will say nowhere else. And then we'll register that spot to you. Uh, by name, and, and it it doesn't have to be a big, costly thing. Just we've got a spot. This is yours. You won't get swept. Uh, you'll be geographically stable. Um, your your social worker, your family, whatever supports you have, will be able to find you. And I think once we create that structure around homelessness, um, then the, all the money we're putting toward it can actually like begin to do some work. So that's my that's my number one. And I think it addresses a bunch of other things like uh, overload of all of the public safety systems, the ambulance system, that stability will uh, free up some capacity in those other areas. Have you seen that work in other jurisdictions? Or No, I, I think the whole West Coast has kind of suffered from this just simple paralysis. And I think it's the, the, the ideological versus the practical thing, right? And we've really wanted to talk about it as solely like a housing problem. Mm-hmm. And like um, somebody with a severe fentanyl addiction, somebody with untreated, unmedicated schizophrenia, they need something different than just like a housing solution. And a housing solution is not coming here tomorrow. So what are we gonna do in the meantime? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, totally. Um, and then was, were there any other issues that uh, uh, you'd like to see in a dream world? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we had 1.8 police officers per thousand mm-hmm. residents in 2002. We're down to 1.2. So we've kind of like, as the city grew, we kind of starved that uh, sector. Yeah. And, um, and it kind of went okay for a while, um, but it's not enough. It's not enough to do the work that needs to be done. It uh, short changes both a police officer we may be asking to like run from thing to thing and deal with, um, you know, the the customer, the person who needs help, who is also being shortchanged mm-hmm. because, you know, they can't give them the time and like the care that they deserve. So I think we need to immediately commit to moving back toward that 1.8. Uh, per thousand and we won't be able to instantly do it just due to training times and flow through capacity but we send an important signal uh, when we do that we say we, we're going to authorize 
300 positions, which is about what it would take. We're going to go ahead and say that we're going to fill these. It might take us a few years, but we're sending a signal to people who might want to go into the profession. You know, um, people might be asking themselves, should I live in Portland with my family and mm -hmm. serve in this capacity there? I think we got to send that clear signal that like, here's what we're doing. Do I want to invest money here and open a business? Yeah. That, uh, you know, I'm very passionate about baseball. And it's like, you can't bring an executive from the airport, drive him down I-84 and put him in, you know, the Ritz downtown and say, hey, invest a billion dollars here. I mean, it's just, um, it doesn't work. And, but, um, you know, speaking on the, on the, on the police thing, um, you know, in 2020, there was a big, um, you know, there were really large protests that d demand, demanded defunding police. In Portland, there's a couple of ways to look at that. Yeah. And, and the way that I look at it is in um, in 2005, so the city council basically <clears throat> allocates the number of police officers um, that the bureau is able, able to hire. Yeah. Um, that peak was 2005. Um, they uh, allocated a little bit over like a thousand um, billets or whatever for, for police officers. And we've seen that number shrink mm -hmm. all the way up until 2024. Now we can talk about defunding police and look at a number. One thing we can't, that's a lot harder to understand is like what's admin doing with the money, mm -hmm. but we can always tell like if money is going to police officers and things like that. Yeah. Defunding or, or cutting back the number of police, it worked when we had positive momentum and we only had 30 homicides in, in the city. Yeah. But like now, it's kind of like over, like you said, it's overloaded the system. Yeah. And uh, I think people have kind of like broken through and, and really realized like the impact that that's having. Um, downtown is sort of, you know, I'm, I'm a downtown resident and um, it's an epicenter for the homelessness. And, you know, I, I feel like <laughs> we've been dealing with this crisis for at least, you know, eight years down there. Yeah. Like just, you know, with campers, wherever and stuff like that. Um, and it's starting to filter out more so in the neighborhoods and people are being in like your spring water trail um, yeah. a lot of people in that neighborhood complain that they, they don't feel comfortable using it anymore um, because of safety concerns so um, it's really interesting seeing how the electorate's thoughts are just shifting on the issue and how um, just letting people stay in tents or is not very compassionate so. yeah yeah I think I think people are waking up to the saying compassionate things and some and money and ideology like isn't isn't going to do it yeah and so they want something done so so let's do it it's an exciting time um is there anything else you wanted to share uh share with the viewers <laughs> oh man a broad open-ended one. Oh yeah uh <laughs> no uh you know uh, uh, we, we do have a lot of veterans that watch this show yeah um oh, a well. lot of a lot of vietnam veterans okay um so you know, they, you know, it's definitely yeah. something that matters to. Well, I, but... I'm happy to talk to that. Uh, so <laughs> but, yeah, I spent, I spent, I went from uh, E1 from the lowest rank oh, in the wow. army to, uh, to being a, a flight lead a Black Hawk pilot. And uh, boy, I did a bunch of jobs along the way. And uh, yeah, a, a great experience. And I think you don't get leadership training uh, in the same way in other parts of our society, like you do in the military. Not, not all because, um, you know that they've got great programs but because when people have total total power over your life you really quickly learn like you know how those choices affect affect them you know mm -hmm. uh what is it like when you work on a team where you're just thrown together with people and it's and it's life and death and uh so you know my experience with uh, the military is like there's a lot of things i took away from that that are very meaningful i'm very glad uh to not be there anymore oh, yeah. <laughs> And it's getting uh, wild out there in the and world. And glad to go home every day after work to, you know, place I live and like. And, um, yeah. Okay. Nice to be in Portland. Well, sweet. Yeah. Well, if you have anything else, uh, let us know. But otherwise, we'll say thank you. Anytime, John. All right. Appreciate it. Um, you can send Bruce back All right. if you like. And I'll keep talking rumors with the uh, guests. So, um, so yeah, we talked a little bit about the Public Elections Commission, and um, recently reduced 
Welcome back, Bruce. Oh, I had a great interview with Eli. Oh, great. Fantastic. Um, Sounded good. Did you know he was a veteran also? Oh, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Very yeah, he, shamed, he shared a little bit about um, the leadership experience that he gained. Oh, yes. Everybody goes through boot camp, see? Yeah. yeah and yeah. so, and, and one of the nice things that here, you know, it's like he has that experience where it's just a group of people mm -hmm. that kind of know what to do but they need leadership. Right, 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 right. And right. so how do you, you know, how do you manage that? How do you manage your ego? How, how do you, you know, you can actually see mm -hmm. how your decision making mm -hmm. is actually impacting mm -hmm. real people. Mm -hmm. Well, you see the profession is he's in as far as, as far as law enforcement, it's a para, paramilitary kind of an operation to a certain degree. And, and in many ways when you're recruiting, if someone has already gone through boot camps and whatever, you got some of the basics mm -hmm. that you need, if you will, to be a law enforcement officer, right? And that's good to a certain degree because uh, then you can kind of relate, if you will, normally to the folks. But, it, but, but sometimes the structure is not as rigid as it is if you were in the military. Right. So consequently, we, we still have law enforcement, but at the same time, uh, you know, it, it's a structure. So you're planning on doing a, a little bit more in-depth interview oh, with very, him? Very, very much so, very much so. So we're going we're gonna to give the viewing audience an opportunity to, to see the training and things of that nature and that rationale. I can't wait to watch that episode. Well, it's, it's, I'm going to be a viewer on that one. Well, it's going to be a good one. If you can remember, one of the things that, um, and I, it just slipped my mind to ask uh, Eli, is... You know, there is a bottleneck in the pipeline for new recruits. Okay, yes. And so all recruits have to go through the Salem Academy. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, would he be interested in having like a regional training facility? Well, in all due respect, the system is already there. And they do have some training, some training aspects within within the respective law enforcement around the state. Mm -hmm. Each one of them, have, they might have a, they might have talked about... Uh, um, um, just a quickie uh, talking to that respective ter terrain, as if to say they would have training for Portland. Yeah, and then there is a Salem. I've spoken training. to a few sheriffs yeah. around yeah. the state, it and there, there, there's a disconnect. You know, yeah. it's like yeah. the sheriffs from around, you know, rural Oregon have right. a different view on right. policing right. than people right. here in the metro right. area. Right. Right. And so, you know, if the people feel that police should be different, mm -hmm. um, Maybe we should set up our own school. And well, guess what? That's going to be part of some of that, 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 that conversation I'm going to be having mm -hmm. with him because he is actually in the system. Yeah. He is, he's a Portland policeman aspect of it. And so when you think about it, we need to educate the public. He said we're about 300, uh, he, about 300 uh, officers short. From Three short. Idea. Right, right, right. Well, sometimes recruitment is a different. I was a recruiter. You know, I was a professional yeah. recruiter for the Marine Corps. Okay. And that's how I came to Portland as a recruiter. Mm -hmm. I got trained <laughs> as a recruiter, okay? Mm -hmm. And I was recruiting individuals to go in the Marine Corps, i.e. military, but specifically in the Marine Corps. And so I was well trained along that particular line. In fact, I was kind of like a recruiter of the year. A lot of times, yeah. You know, I, did, I did my job well. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I felt good about it because uh, folks that I, I focused on were folks that were, were, sh were short in regards to maybe the education process or this, that, and that. They had no careers. And so I felt good about that. Those individuals who had careers, got me, mm -hmm. and who were uh, who had some sense of direction, I have no problem with that. Go to school, get your degree, this, that, and the other. But those individuals who, who, who didn't have any, any sense of a career, that, that Marine, the, 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 the military, actually molded you into and trained you in and sp identified a career for you because there's no such thing as unemployment in the military. <laughs> everybody has a job. Right. Everybody right. has a job. It's like a small city, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But everybody has a job. That's a good thing. So so consequently, uh, uh, that's why I'm making the point about identifying uh, law enforcement as paraprofessional because they have to physically touch someone if you will, in many cases or whatever, but just like, and, and you have two different, different entities. You got, you got the, let's say in Portland, you got the Portland Police Department, they pick up the individual, you know what I mean? And they take them to the Sheriff Department. And then the Sheriff Department, again, that's kind of like going for them because they still have to touch them aspect of it. But their job is not to arrest, blah, blah, blah. Theirs is to focus on incarceration, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Prepare them for the judge to get their, their, their fair, their fairness, if you will, in, in the in the legal justice system, that kind of a stuff aspect of it. So, so 
uh, we just need to educate. That's another. So, and then you got the DA, mm -hmm. and that basically handles the legality thing after they're in the, in jail. Mm -hmm. You got me. Mm -hmm. And then after that, then they're either sent down to the institution. Where, where Mike Reese is now, he's he's the new warden, mm -hmm. if you will. There, they go down there, and then that's when you do basically your time, for based on what the judge says. Well, okay, fine. You got to spend so much time in most cases to get rehabbed, and then once you get rehabbed, you come out, and hopefully you you're a functional, uh, i.e., taxpayer. Ideally, pay, yeah. pay your rent, right. so to speak, <laughs> you, you, like all of us are, right? Mm -hmm. But so we just need to educate the people about what those different entities are and and that we are paying for and what areas that we're paying in for and and what the what these individuals should how you should respond to these individuals so they need to be educated and which we're not doing we're just not doing that and, and so I, I, I and again i think with I, I i i do believe him being um a bicycle cop allows him to communicate and community police on a better better level mm -hmm. uh, than somebody that's uh, rolling around in a cruiser and I understand the reasoning behind it you know the cruiser gives them access to so many more problems and everything like that but again just creating that that connection with the people that they're providing law enforcement to I think can alleviate a lot of problems mm -hmm. well I, I, I go with the bicycle. You know, we got horses too. You know what I mean? We you lost know? our horses yeah, though. Yeah, I know, but with all due respect, you know, when you when you've got two people in a car, you got me. You know, when you, you there's other things. You know, my point is they can they can get immediately to a, a situation. You can't do that with a bicycle, mm -hmm. and you can't do that with a horse in many ways. You know, the fact of the matter, they are law enforcement officers. And the public, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in there with, with hopefully uh, the, the, the gentleman that you just got through interviewing aspect of it, just using him as a source when I'm talking about law enforcement aspect of it. But, but in all due reality, they're basically, they, they enforce the laws that the people enact through their elected officials. Mm -hmm. Got me? Mm -hmm. And we don't understand that yet. And the people need to know that because then once they do that, then they've got something to work on. Because, see, they will be doing how to report a crime. Mm -hmm. Got me? Mm -hmm. if it, so what is the definition of reporting a crime? How do you do that? Well, do you pick up the phone? Or do you call your, your elected official? Do you send or a do tweet? You call a tweet? <laughs> or you, do you, what is 911? Well, what does I, always, that mean? I always thought it was interesting. I don't know if they changed this, but they never had 911 painted on the cars. That's true. That's right. They always that's had right. the Twitter handle. That's, that's right. That's right. I understand. So, a, lot, a lot of people don't go that way. See, well, and then, and then, like, do they have nine one one in Japan? Yeah, you know, we get a yeah, lot of Japanese yeah, tourists. Yeah, you know, yeah, and so yeah. it's like if a Japanese tourist sees a crime, what are they going to do? Get on Twitter, or are they yeah. going to call nine one one? Right, 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 right. So, but you know, but then we got, we got the whole <laughs> issue of community policing. See, yeah, see, and the community policing. All due respect, it's the community. You say community. Now you're saying, in so many ways, they tend to identify the actual law enforcer to be the community police officer and that's not the case that's not what they do so so we need to reinforce the reinforce the confidence of the people who live in the actual communities to be a part of from the standpoint of like neighborhood blocks and you know put that structure together get them involved you don't necessarily have to physically stand out there and hey that, that, here's a guy over here that did this no you that's not you that's not what you want to do but I, I would, I personally, I would like to see the cops walk a beat. Oh, yeah, that's good. You know, go and introduce yourself, you know, walk a beat for four hours, pop your head into a business, say hello, be a presence. Well, just uh, like we've distrificized, we've distrificized the, the city of Portland, mm -hmm. you know, due respect, we should sort of districtize an area for all the cops, that, as far as that beat is concerned. They should know where, they, they should know these neighbors, these individuals, introducing themselves. Normally, the way you do that is through the uniform. Yeah, and, and you know, in an ideal world for me, um, how I would like to reform it is I'd like to see police do their job similar to, like, mailmen. Like what? Uh, like mail, pers mail carriers. Okay, okay. Um, where, you know, you have a kiosk. And they got a uniform. They got a uniform. You have a kiosk. You walk. You know the green, oh, sure, you know the sure. green mailboxes? Sure, sure. You know, the green mailboxes are just for the mailmen, mm -hmm. the, yeah. the mail carriers. Yeah. And so have the police officer there, have a kiosk for them where they have sure. all their stuff, 
have a market beat. Okay. Well, we're going in the right direction. Yeah. See, we're having a discussion. Yeah. And that's the whole idea. Thing, whole idea. We just need to have an instruction. They have, uh, you know, talk about it, and then let them under let them understand. You're already there. Just let's structure it, so we have an actual plan. So we don't have these these other issues that that we're being addressed. Well, I, I did talk to Eli a bit, a bit, little bit about the difference I find between like the small town sheriff and the big city police officer, and the small town sheriff. You got to remember, it's like every interaction they have, they have an interaction with somebody that most likely has a gun yeah, on them, yeah, yeah. right? But they're they're shooting people at a lesser rate, not you know. Well, they're, they're jailers, and all due respect, but they, but they. they and we need to talk about that. We well, well, part make some of it changes. is they, they know, you know, their their community is small enough that they know just about everybody in the community, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And then so, like, once you know everybody in the community, that whole unfamiliarity mm -hmm. fear is gone. Mm -hmm. You get to know who's crazy, who's not crazy, you know, who's crazy dangerous, who's just crazy not dangerous, and there's a big difference. And I, I think a lot of the bad stuff happens with crazy not dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and, illness, yeah, yeah. and then you know who the strangers are. Right, 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 right. Well, a lot of times when you think about when you think about the police department and the sheriff department, you know, they're both officers, mm -hmm. but one's a jailer and one who picks up the individual. He has to deal with the most dangerous part initially picking the person up right now once they get into that uh, that confined area piece but that's they have to those individuals have to deal with it still a thing but it, it's controlled somewhat right mm -hmm. I mean, but but the only time the sheriff actually get involved with let's let's say let, 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 the police it, it, it could be a, it could be a, a good support base mm -hmm. if they need extra support they should be able to access some of those officers that are sheriffs to come and deal with the deal with well them. actually so portland used to have a reserve officer program yeah they do that yeah yeah, yeah yeah where you know and so you know one of the things i'd like to do is see you know increased police officers walking a beat well what we did maybe eight years ago or ten years ago is sent the reserve police officers over to the county mm -hmm. so now our reserve component is over there i would like to see the city bring that mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. and um what i i you know i there's probably legal parts of this that I don't know, but I would like to have cops walk a beat in merchant areas, oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, in, in yeah. senior citizen areas. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. I live by Terwilliger Plaza. You know, there's over a thousand seniors that live over there. Yeah, right. It would and be really know, cool for them to have a cop that just they, walked through they, that they should, neighborhood. They well, the city tried this piece just when when Joanne was there, mm -hmm. hard to see. She was a commissioner, and she had that that street walking beat. Remember downtown? Okay. Uh, vaguely, I kind of, I remember the but, Portland Street but, response. Yeah, right. With that kind of a piece, was that kind of a yeah. piece? But you know, in all due respect, one of the problems I thought had right up front with it, they really didn't negotiate and sit down and talk with officers to make sure that they that that they, they were a part of that process. And I think the first thing that they should have done should have been discussed. Those individuals should have been wearing uniforms of some types. The same blues that that the officers maybe maybe without a weapon during the daylight hours, and specifically, uh, so, and, and and but they didn't have those kinds of discussions. I think I think if uh, a police officer was walking for eight hours a day, that would completely change his kit setup, their right. their kit setup. Right, right. You know, and it's like. You know, if you're in full body armor, you're going to react to problems differently than if well, you don't have full, full well, body armor. Well, I've always thought about, yeah. you know, the way you see these cats now they're packed, just like when I was when I was in the Marine Corps, when I was packed. But, you know, I mean, after a certain period of time, I got the rest. You know what I'm saying? I can't run and catch a cat fully packed. Right. Got me? And they expect, but they expect these guys to do the same thing. So, so But you, we, you also, you know, you, it's going to be hard to walk with a full, uh, yeah, full pack. Oh, yeah, and so yeah, maybe... Yeah. Uh, you're nicer to people <laughs> when, when, you, when you know when when you when you don't have a bunch of armor and stuff on you. You know, well, maybe. But but like I said, I'm more <laughs> interested in terms of what are they trained to do? They're supposed to be trained to enforce the law. Right now, what is the definition of? the enforcement of that law. All right. Well, we're, we're jumping. We're going to ruin the next episode. And we've got our next candidate I, I'm here. I'm glad you could have uh, <laughs> Sarah's like, well, I can tell you're very passionate. I got about. you. I got you. I understand. Sounds good. We got we got a candidate? Yeah. Did you get a chance to meet her? I know uh, she might have been outside. I'm going to meet her because I'm going to check her out and see how this thing's going. All right. I know she's an excellent candidate. Well, right. send her over, I please. mean, just the mere fact that she filed to run for office. Yeah. That's a very, that's a very responsible position. 
if she files to run for office, that means she wants to be a part. Now she's got something in the front of her name, mm -hmm. right? She's running for commissioner. Mm -hmm. See, now, now she has to have a resume, right? She has some great something. retail experience. I don't want to ruin it for us. And, and but. If, it, if it relates, guess what? She'll get elected. That's the game. Sounds great? All right. Okay. PD, Portland Real. Sounds good. Portland Real. Okay. Oh, that's it. Right. How are you doing? Welcome aboard. Wonderful. Thanks, thank so you. good to meet you. Thank you for taking the responsibility of running. I am honored to. I am totally honored to. Yes, all right. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Hey, Welcome. Hey, John. It's hey, good to good see you. Good to see you. Just come on over here. This right is your seat. Okay, yeah, I get to sit here. Okay. Yeah. I hope it's okay. I brought some notes. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you like get in front of the camera and then all of a sudden you can't remember your name. Yeah, I do, I do <laughs> but Bruce is always there to fill in the, the holes for you. Good, good, good. Yeah, you were one of the uh, first candidates. Um, yeah. We can bring you on to the... Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, so yeah, you were one of the first uh, first candidates to get involved. Wow. Um, so tell us, tell us a little bit about uh, your, your background. Okay, so um, let's see. I grew up in Portland, um, not exactly wealthy. My parents uh, were artisans. They sold stained glass boxes at the Portland Saturday Market. Oh, cool. Yeah, so um, I spent a fair amount of time as a little kid running around under the Burnside Bridge. It was a little bit of a different scene then than it is now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, and then um, grew up in Portland. I went to Reed College. Uh, and uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And then I, um, I heard of environmental engineering. Hmm. And back then, as now, environmental issues were very pressing and there was a lot of discussion. You know, it was the spotted owl, you know? Yeah. Like timber um, it versus, you know, jobs versus the environment. And I was like, well, can't we have both? I mean, <laughs> we need the environment to live. Yeah. And, you know, we need us. Um, so let's find ways where we can, you know, work together and live with nature well. Excuse me, this is community television, so okay. I can do that. You know, yeah. commercial stuff, whole sure. different ball game. All right, hello. Sure. We only, we only yeah. have three minutes. Okay, well, oh, well I think we're going to bring her back on right. for That's the okay. second session. Why don't you just wait for a minute, okay. and we'll just, we'll just get so we can have a good time. Yeah, okay. Okay. no problem. Give her the time. So why don't you yeah. just start a, start closing notch a little bit, Okay. and then we'll just kind of... You know, okay, and yeah. you can start it, and we'll, we'll we'll start it over. That's right. We'll uh, yeah, okay. yeah. So we, uh, yeah, we were, no, just we were talking. just just keep talking. Yeah. Okay. So just we'll just, close we'll, we'll just, yeah, we'll sure. just continue no, having. No. Uh, we, got, we got about two minutes there, so okay. we'll just close. Why don't you just go on? Right. And oh, I'll, yeah. just, I'll help him close. Okay. And then we'll, get, we'll yeah. bring you right back. <laughs> no problem. We're gonna give you more time. All right. Well, All right, thank you. I appreciate that. Right Okay. Good. Sorry about that, John. No, no problem. I I lose track of the time. I get so interested in these. I'm gonna put it on you. We were talking about law enforcement, which was good. Yeah. <laughs> but we got that squared away, okay? Yeah. But, uh, well, this has been great so yeah. far. This has been really great. And uh, I think we covered quite a bit. We've covered quite a bit. We opened it up real good. And, and so what we're going to be doing is that we're going to continue uh, 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 interviewing these candidates as, uh, as much as we can, as many as we can. And so what we'll do with the last interview that we had, that was pretty short. And we're going to just carry that over to for our next show. Yeah, and, and so you know we'll we did that. a nice deep dive in law enforcement issues good, with good. Uh, Eli, and it it, it seems um, you know with what Sarah Sarah started introducing was mm -hmm. a, an environmental angle. Oh, fantastic! And we're going to talk a little bit about environmental stewardship. Well, it's a major world. issue in the Absolutely. city of Portland, and to have someone of her caliber running, I think that's that's great. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic, and that that's what we into, right? Yeah. Folks with resumes. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, what she's I mean? a Portland native. Good. Uh, you know, grew up at, it sounds like she grew up in Portland Saturday Market. Oh, wow. Ooh, I like that. Um, so she's had an opportunity to see sort of the changes that have gone down oh, uh, down there and That's everything good. like that. That's so good. I'm really excited to have well, well, look, great job. All right, great job. Looking good, and hopefully the viewing audience will will share these uh, these shows with uh, with their neighbors and things and have these discussions like we're doing. Yes. Because the, this gives the, the, the candidate more than uh, 15 seconds, if you will, to chat about this, that, and the other, and a little bit more humus, uh, a human way of doing things. Uh, get to see the person and then and see what that resume looks like, which you do a good job, by the way, on oh. that front part. All right. Appreciate that, John? Yeah. Okay, good. So, well, so, well, folks, well, thank you very, very much, and uh, like I said, we'll see you on uh, on Bodas Dice in our next segment, and we are going to interview the young lady that was just on and in our next show, and then we'll go from there. Sounds good? Sounds good. Thanks, John. Great right. job. Well done. All right, see you then.